first I just want to say thank you for agreeing to do this interview with me and it really means a lot that you're able to share your story with all of us. Thank you for asking me to do it. I like it. Okay, so let's begin by talking a little bit about your childhood. Can you tell me where you were born, what your family was like, and what kind of education you received? I was born in India in the year 1944 when the British still ruled India. So we were part of the Commonwealth. And I grew up in the city of Bombay. And I went to a parochial school. Uh, most Parsis or sent their children to those schools, which was, was, we in India used to call them convents. Now, convents doesn't mean we lived there, but convent was something that was tied in with the Catholic uh, religion. So, uh, we had, at least I had Irish nuns as teachers and Indian nuns. And, and we used to have 11 grades, not 12 like here. So, we went, I went to a parochial school, graduated from there, uh, and we had two, uh, two types of schools. One was SSC, which was the Indian school system, and one was Cambridge, which was with, the, with England. I went to the Cambridge one, and uh, we, we had, our curriculum came from uh, England, from, uh, what is what, from, From, this, from the town of Cambridge, which is where the university is, but this was at a high school level of ours. So, did that, graduated, and then I did, um, what, I did uh, college, how would I say, I did college, like a commerce kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. And then we, then I took a little, then I went to work. I had a job in India. And then I, I, I loved the Girl Guides and the Girl Scout movement. I was very interested in it and I joined that. My school did not have it, but another school, a Parsi school had it. So I joined in their group and I did a lot of uh, traveling and things with the Girl Scout, Girl Guide Association. And uh, right, uh, we, okay, there was a golden anniversary, a golden jubilee of the movement that came up. And they had a very big meeting in Japan. So there were quite, I think we were like six or seven Parsi girls that were chosen to represent India, and you we were all from Bombay, and we went to Japan. And we had, I think it was like a, a week, one week or 10 days or something like that, uh, where we were introduced to their culture and uh, we met with the then Princess Michiko and I think at that time her husband was a crown prince. Later on she became empress and he became emperor. But at that time uh, she, she was still a princess. And we were there in 1970. And they had the big, very beautiful expo, world expo in Japan. So we were very lucky to even visit that part and see and then we had to spend, we got to spend basically about four or five days with a family. So uh, another Parsi girl and myself, we were with a family and it was a very lovely family. And I think uh, the gentleman, the, the father, we had to call him Papa San. And so he was something in the, I think, the car industry or something because they were driving the latest and the greatest cars. 
anyway it was a very fun time and we came back to india and let's see what happened after that after that i got married i got married in 1971 and uh my husband but at that time was all uh when he when we got married he at that time had a job in iran because the king of iran the shah had come to india at that time and he saw that there were many young kids out of college who would, who did not have a job so in association with um the iranian cultural association there was that he put the offer that all iranians all parsis i mean all the rashtrians were welcome because we were the original people living in iran so he said the country was open to having us there and he offered us jobs so uh, bejan my husband went to iran and along with i think 15 16 other people from bombay and that's where he was working so he was already working there when i got married so he came to india and then i i went and i went to iran that was a little bit of a cultural shock to me because i did not know the language and uh everything was in farsi everything the tv the news the people the writing everything and it was difficult very difficult for me and we met a uh, one zoroastrian family out there and the other parsis or the other ones we could talk to you know because of the language barrier my landlady uh, had six or seven children i'm not quite sure i forgot it and she would talk to them and i would listen and she would say follow along us that way i basically learned the language by total immersion living with that family in the same building and i got to a point where i had really mastered the language so much so then when i moved to tehran from isfahan i used to do translations for my boss he was a german swiss i don't know he had so many passports i, I cannot keep pace with it but learn so uh i spent 6 years basically in iran when we were in isfahan we did travel a lot around and i saw quite a few things there outside of isfahan which at that time was not such a big it was a tourist attraction but not as big as it is now uh i saw the ruins of a fire temple and you could make out that it was a fire temple at one point but currently it had crumbled and it was ruined and there were many other places where you could see that there was a touch of zoroastrianism in those ruins we traveled a lot in iran not as much as i would have loved to but we went and visited pira sabs which is a place uh people go on pilgrimage it has some uh things that would there's a story if you are going to look it up and from there we visited a a little village called chem i mean and those people were still you you could think they were still in the olden days they were very leery of meeting with strangers they would look at us and the little old ladies would sit they had little very poorly built houses or uh, mud cottages or something and the, there also i saw a lot of things that impressed me about the rationalism that they had kept their religion alive against all odds that means that they still had a fire burning in a local it it was it was a little house very not descript you never would make out that there was a uh, like a little gallery inside or a little place of worship but we stayed with the dastur and he showed us where he would go and keep the fire burning under it was covered up in a lot of ash so even if somebody came they would not know what was going on and right outside that place where he lived 
and the little fire temple was was a tree it was it's a they think it's a blessed tree i don't know don't quite know the name of the tree but it had it never would die down it had any weather any season the tree was always green and it had a lot of desert around it but it was still flourishing then we saw that and we stayed with them in a little house where one room was occupied but all of us sleeping on the floor and the other room was the cattle where we had to go and you know do whatever you wanted to do and uh, get out of the house uh, because there was no other bathrooms out there so we that next door was the cattle and we spent a couple of days nights there it was very touching to see how people had lived and they were still living some of them the older people would sit out and look at you like you have come from where and then i think from that uh from chem we visited the apardana which was where king cyrus had his palace and we went through that and uh who was it alexander and his army had come and set fire to it and burnt everything to the ground so all you can see are the pillars of it standing the glory of the palace was of course long gone so and then right outside there the palace area where was a little tomb it was cyrus the great his tomb it was a little hilly uh, like a little mound and a little message that says please uh, let me rest here in peace in this little piece of land so cyrus apparently paid uh, uh, so no what was his name alexander at least let the tomb be he did not destroy the tomb because he says let it be let it be so there still stands the tomb of cyrus the great out there the very nondescript for a great man who did so much and i enjoyed living there in iran after once i got the hang of the language it was very beautiful very nice and people were just great when i think after that Uh, we immigrated so when we immigrated we landed in chicago and chicago was my brother who lived there so we came as immigrants literally two suitcases and nothing else to our name and we have achieved what we would call the american dream you work and you can make it here so uh we came and then we had no job it was the middle of winter of bitter winter 1977 with a blizzard and my poor husband would walk trying to go to the library through all that and see if he could find a job and he did find a job except it was like 200 miles south from uh where we were in the US in Chicago so we went there it was nice uh it was a small town so people from bombay like me you know it's like oh it's a small town i like cities and there he got a job and he worked for caterpillar which is a big company and that was the world headquarters of caterpillar and the children my son was born there my daughter was born in bombay and we made good friends out there the children started school and it was a nice little town and i made the best friends out there they were good kind people i had never expected anything other than that and there was nothing racist or anything against us everyone was willing to help you be good to you but it had small town values at such did you connect with other zoroastrians when you arrived uh well my brother was there and then he took us to a couple of meetings with that time there was no darbe mayor they used to meet in either some people's houses or there was a church where they would rent the hall and have a meeting maybe once a month or whatever i don't know 
So we must have met them maybe two, two or three times. After that, we moved to uh, Peoria, where there were no Parsis, not that I knew of. Later on, I think years later, I found there was one girl who was there who was a Parsi. But other than that, no, there were not too, too many Parsis in any of those places. Well, because there were not as many Zoroastrians as you previously had in your, like in the other places that you had lived, how have you strived to preserve your Zoroastrian culture while trying to connect with new cultures? Well, the way it was instilled in me when I was growing up, you know, the prayers and everything I taught passed it down to my children and made sure that they followed it. But there was no other one else where they could compare notes and see what is this and what is that. So we used to make trips to Chicago once in a while. And uh, beyond that, I don't think the children were open to meeting too many people in Peoria. So that all came about once uh, my daughter graduated and she moved to Chicago. And then we started visiting Chicago much more and including ourselves in some of the f- functions they would have here. And my son went off to college in Colorado, then he moved there. So we we are now in, in three places, Chicago, Colorado, and right here, or oh, two places. Between, we traveled a lot. I traveled quite a bit. Mm-hmm. My parents, when I was growing up too, but my dad worked uh, in the merchant navy. He was a chief engineer. So we were very, very lucky to visit London for the coronation of Queen Elizabeth II. And also, uh, it was the usual, you know, damp London weather. We had a very good friends in London, so we went to their house and we saw the entire coronation on TV, which at that point was the first time they had ever done something uh, like that, completely on TV. The queen, the queen's husband said he would like it done and she agreed with him and that's how they did it. So we did that and we saw the coronation and uh, we went and, what else did we see? I think they, at that time, they had just opened up the Suez Canal, which was another marvel of engineering. So you, we went through that, the Suez Canal, and uh, I don't know what else would we do there. We, oh, and then after that, for our 25th wedding anniversary, my husband and myself went to uh, the Middle East, where I had taken a class in uh, in uh, we were offered different kinds of uh, things for senior Cambridge I had taken a class called scripture which encompassed the the Christian religion the Roman Catholic and we got to go to Jerusalem Bethlehem where he was born they showed where they had a little star embedded in the floor and they had that place where you could see where he went up the steps to where he was martyred up. And there was that. And what else did I do? So I had a, had a very, very interesting visit to Israel and Egypt from there. Mm-hmm. Well, what comes to mind when you hear the word home? Would you consider the U.S. to be your home? And if so, how long has it taken to you to feel like you are at home in this country? Uh, well, my parents were in India, so there was my there was a pulling of my heart string that they are there and I'm here. Mm-hmm. And I think from we've now lived here since nine since 1977. So, 77 to now, uh, it's been close to, what, 50, 40, 44 something years, mm-hmm. 44, 45 years, and we were welcomed very warmly, 
to the country is very different from what people are you know seeing nowadays that whether you come into the country and they look at you or something but we had a beautiful experience we were greeted at the airport in O'Hare by the authorities and they said please come here and we sat down there and they took our pictures and they handed us a green card right there and then and said welcome welcome we love you here or something but it was very very warm welcome and then we stayed here as i said to look for a job and then we found it in peoria so we moved there in iran there were some places that you had to go and see, which I was, I wasn't fortunate to go there, but it was called Pira Sabs, which was a story of a king, a Zoroastrian king and his uh, daughter, and the Muslims attacked the Arabs, and she had to flee on a horse, so she got on the horse and started riding, and they were chasing her, and chasing her, and finally she said, she asked, Please, God, open up something like that. I can lose them. So right in front of her, there was a little hilly, mountainous thing. The mountain opened up, and she and the horse went right through it, and the mountain closed. But as the mountain closed, a piece of her clothing got caught on it. So for many years, they used to see that piece of clothing out there. Now, I don't know how many years or how long or what, but that's what it was. And right there, there is, it's a desert. But there was a beautiful little waterfall and greenery. So that, that Peter serves is something like a saint. And many people go there. And they also showed where the, the Zoroastrians lived in the mountains, like in little cave-like things. So, you know, you see these things and it touches you to see how far back your religion has come from and what you are experiencing out there. So on that like same note, do you think if you had stayed in Iran or India, your kids would have learned more about the Zoroastrian religion? Uh, no, not necessarily, because there are so many people here in the U.S., all the Dastrujis and people who are scholars, they write books and they we have get-togethers once a year, I think, when they have the, the, the Mobits come and talk about the religion. So, no, we are not missing out much because what you can learn here is just as good as if we were still in India. One of the greatest challenges as a community today is to encourage young individuals like me to view their Zoroastrian self as integral to who they are. So, do you have any suggestions for families on how they can assist young children in making this important realization as they explore their identities? Well, as I said, when we were in Peoria, we had nothing to fall back on for my children to learn. In in here, Chicago, the Darby Mayor runs an excellent, excellent program with children's religion classes, which I wish was there when we were here with the younger kids of ours. But my grandchildren have learned so much by going to this EAC classes. And so if everyone you know, follows it and takes great joy and helps out, I think we can do very well for our new generation. How important is Zoroastrianism in your daily life? Well, I pray a lot. That's one thing about me. I pray a lot and uh, I've taught my children the regular prayers. I know they may not pray three and four times a day, but I think they still follow most of the tenets of the religion and try and instill just do three things good thoughts good words and good deeds and you'd be fine and then do you have any advice for future generations of Zoroastrians looking to move to the U.S. be proud of your religion many people don't know what our religion is and what it stands for and I have so many friends who took great interest when I told them I was a Russian and said, what is that? And so I would explain and people like to hear about it. And they say, oh, thank you for telling us something about it. And <clears throat> the other thing that is, is when Christmas comes around, 
we are reminded that the three wise men who came from uh, Asia across the mountains through the, were three Zoroastrian priests. The three wise men were three Zoroastrian priests. And that's what they were. They came, they saw the star, followed it, and it led them to where Jesus was born. So there is some continuity between the two religions. And they are, they are very happy to know that we did this and we came and we, you know, met with so many people and explained things to them. So they see what our religion is all about. We, there is not any kind of a, a involvement in seeing how many people we can convert or anything. We don't do that. We just like to live and let live. <clears throat> And what role did the Zoroastrian Association play in your adjustment in this country? Uh, we were not in touch with the Zoroastrian Association. As I said, we were in Peoria, so that was nothing. There was nobody there. So whatever we've learned now is very nice. It's very good to mix and mingle with people and knowing we have the same culture, same prayers. So we try and keep pace with everything that is offered at the ZAC. Do you still maintain ties with people back in your native country? Yes, yes. Everything from my school to college to my office people in India, in in uh, where else? In Peoria. Yes, I I keep in touch with everyone I can. Would you do you have anything more to share that I may have missed out upon asking you about? I mean, if if you anyone's interested, if they look go back and look at the two thousand five hundred years of uh, the Pahlavi realm in Iran, every person and lots of people and all the kings and queens came to Iran for that two thousand five hundred year celebration, and they did a lot to show and showcase the background of the community there, how people lived, how they came about. It's a beautiful country, and except at this point, I don't think we can visit. Yeah. That's sad. Yeah. Do you have anything else to share? No. I consider myself blessed. I've got lots of friends, lots of family, lots of friends here also, and we like it here, and we are glad to visit India once in a while when the parents were there, and now I don't go that much. And we have been very blessed with everybody good. We've never had anything bad happen or anything racist against the religion or us as Parsis, nothing. Everything, everything is good. That's good. Well, thank you so much for doing this interview with me, and I really appreciate the time that you Thanks. took to do this with me. Thank you, dear.